Daily Minutes nummer 1466 met een uitzending voor vandaag 11 november 2018. Dit is het bulletin van zondag. This broadcast will be almost entirely in English, but we will start in Dutch. Vandaag is er een extra lange uitzending met onder andere het RSGB nieuws en de versie van TX Talk. Hallo, dit is Mike Marsh, G1IAR, en welkom to the TX News podcast of the GP2RS National News for Sunday, the 11th of November 2018, supplied by the Radio Society of Great Britain and brought to you by TX Factor. The news headlines this week India gets 60, 630, and 6,000 meters. Join the Legacy Committee and register for next Bath Distance Learning Course. The Indian government's telecommunications regulator has published a 2018 update to the Indian National Frequency Plan, effective from the 25th of October. It lists new amateur bands at 5 MHz, 472 and 136 kilohertz. In more details, that means 5351.5 and 5366.5 kilohertz as secondary users with 15 watts EIRP, 472 to 479 kilohertz is also as a secondary user, this time with 1 watt EIRP. And finally, there's 135.7 to 137.8 kilohertz, again as a secondary user with 1 watt EIRP. The regulations follow current ITU criteria for all these bands. The RSGB Legacy Committee considers applications to the Legacy Fund for project funding and makes recommendations to the board. One of the current members is coming toward the end of his term of office and the RSGB is looking for a new member to take his place. Most applications for funding are discussed via email exchanges and three meetings are arranged each year and they're generally carried out via Skype. Full information on the volunteer role, if you're interested, can be found at tinyurl.com forward slash gb2rs hyphen 111 alpha. The next advanced distance learning course will be run by the Bath based team and it's due to start on the 1st of February 2019, aiming for an exam in July or August. The team will then look at the new syllabus and so there'll be no Bath distance learning courses for 6 to 12 months. The course is free, but students must provide their own textbook, calculator and arrange their own exam when the time comes. Guidance is provided by the course team and a £40 deposit is required to secure a place on the course, but this is refunded to those who complete the training. Deposits from students who did not complete the course and generous donations from students who did have so far raised over £14,000 for charities like the RCF, British Wireless for the Blind and RAIB. Courses are limited and the last four were completely filled up well before the start date. So if you're interested in joining, I would get in touch very quickly with the course leader who is Steve Hartley, Golf Zero Foxtrot Uniform Whiskey. Do it without delay and get on the emails to g0fuw at tiscally.co.uk. At the IARU Region 1 interim meeting in Vienna 2016, it was agreed to reorganise the VHF handbook to make it more readable for all interested users. IARU Region 1 has now made version 8.12 of the VHF handbook available as a free PDF download. If you'd like to download it, head over to tinyurl.com forward slash gb2rs hyphen 1111b for Bravo. Starting on Monday the 12th and running until Sunday the 18th, the Essex CW Activity Week is a friendly 
non-contest style event to encourage CW operators old and new. Whilst the object is obviously to work as many radio amateurs as possible in a week, it's hoped that QSOs will go beyond just an exchange of RST and become a little bit of a CW chat for as long as you wish. Listen out for the club call sign, Golf X-Ray 1 Foxshot Charlie Whiskey, which will also be on the air during the activity week. The exchange is signal report and name for non-members of the group, and members add their membership number. For full details, just search for Essex CWARC. More videos from the AMSAT UK colloquium part of the RSGB convention held at Milton Keynes on the 13th and the 14th of October this year are now available on the AMSAT UK YouTube channel. Among the presentations is one by Graham Sherville, Golf 3 Victor Zulu Victor and Dave Crump, Golf 8 Golf Kilo Quebec, all about the amateur radio transponders on the satellite SHL-2, which is expected to be launched into a geostationary orbit very soon. To see what's available, go over to youtube.com slash user slash AMSAT UK slash videos. December is Youngsters on the Air Month around the world and details of stations in the UK who will be operating GB18 Yota will soon be announced. The idea for this event is to show the amateur radio hobby to young people of course and to encourage youngsters to be active on the amateur bands. As part of Yota Month, Bob Whiskey 9 X-Ray Yankee and Ken Kilo 4 Zulu Whiskey will be travelling to Ethiopia to team up with the Echo Tango 3 Alpha for Alpha Club at the Addis Ababa's University Institute of Technology. You can let them both know what bands and modes you need ET on by taking a quick survey at surveymonkey.com forward slash r forward slash 982 kilo 53 whiskey. That's your headline news for this week. Now it's time to take a look at the rallies and the events for the upcoming week. Well, there are no rallies in the diary for the weekend of the 10th and the 11th of November. So we're looking ahead to next weekend now. On Saturday the 17th, the Radars traditional radio rally will be at the St Vincent de Paul's Coldershaw Road off Edenfield Road on the A680. It's in Norden, which is Rochdale. Postcode is Oscar Lima 127. Quebec Romeo. Now doors open to the public at 10.30 a.m. with disabled visitors gaining access 15 minutes earlier. Admission is £2.50 and under 12s get in for free. There's a bring and buy as well as commercial traders and amateur radio sellers on site too. Refreshments available of course and it will include the famous bacon and sausage butties. If you'd like some more details get in touch with Robert Mike Zero November Victor Quebec on his mobile which which is 07778113333. The Nevada Radio and Waters and Stanton Open Day will take place on the 18th of November. It's at Nevada Radio 1 Fitzherbert Spur, that's in Portsmouth, and the postcode is Papa Oscar 6 1 Tango Tango. Doors are open from 10 in the morning to 4.30 in the afternoon. Major manufacturers will be in attendance to demonstrate their latest radios and there's a free burger and free coffee between 11am and 2pm for every attendee. The main warehouse will be open to customers to wander around and pick up many of the one-off deals on the day or pick through a large selection of vintage and used radio equipment as well. If you want to head over to the website there's more details up there just look at nevadaradio.co.uk Next Sunday, the 18th, it's the 41st Cats Radio and Electronics Bazaar, which will be held at the Oasis Academy on the Homefield Road in Coolsdon. Postcode is Charlie Romeo 51 Echo Sierra. There's free car parking, doors open at 10 in the morning, and admission is £1.50. You'll find trade stands, special interest groups, refreshments, and more. And you can get more information from Andy Briers, Golf Zero Kilo Zulu Tango, on his mobile which is 07729 866 600. 
The Plymouth Radio Rally takes place on the 18th. That's at Harewood House on Church Road in Plimpton. Postcode there, Papalima 7, 1 November Hotel. Doors open at 10.30 in the morning and it'll cost you £2 to get in. Those are all the details we have here. If you'd like some more, get in touch with David via email to d.beck123 at Outlook. Com. And as ever, don't forget, if you'd like to get your event into Radcom or onto the GB2RS News, make sure you send your details in as early as possible via email to radcom at rsgb.org.uk. And we need to know at least three to four months in advance to get your information into Radcom. All right, now it's the DX News from 425 DX News and other sources. Ronald Papa Alpha 3, Echo Whiskey Papa, Martin Papa Alpha 4, Whiskey Mike, and Tom Golf Mike 4, Foxtrot Delta Mike will be on Tonga. Iota reference Oscar Charlie 049 between the 13th and the 27th of November. Operating as Alpha 35 Echo Uniform, they plan to operate three stations and use vertical antennas, including VDAs, using CW, SSB and RTTY. If you get a contact, you can QSL direct using OQRS Club Log, Logbook of the World, or you can do it to Tom, Golf Mike 4, Foxtrot Delta Mike, via the Bureau. Dom, Mike 0, Bravo Lima Foxtrot, Rob, Mike 0, Victor, Foxtrot Charlie, and Dan, Mike 0, Whiskey Uniform Tango, will be active as Victor Papa 2, Mike Uniform Whiskey, from Montserrat, that's November Alpha 103, from the 17th to the 23rd of November. They'll be operating CW and SSB on the 80 to 10 metre bands with three stations, QSL via Logbook of the World, Club Logs OQRS, Direct or via the Bureau. Braco Echo 77 Delta X-Ray will be active on the 160 to 10 metre bands as 8 Quebec 7 Delta X-Ray from the Maldives, which is Alpha Sierra 013 until the 25th of November. QSL there is via Logbook of the World or Oscar Echo 1 Echo Mike Sierra. And finally, a team will operate Zulu Yankee 6 Victor from Santa Barbara Island in the Albrolhos Archipelago which is Sierra Alpha 019. They'll be doing that between the 14th and the 19th of November, and they'll be operating SSB, CW and FT8 in Fox and Hound mode on the 160 to 6 metre bands. If you get in touch, you can QSL via Club Logs OQRS, Logbook of the World, or direct to Papa Yankee 6 Hotel Delta. Now the special events news. Well, many special event stations will of course be on the air commemorating Armistice Day, which is Sunday the 11th of November. Listen out for Golf Bravo 1 Foxtrot Bravo, operated by members of the Museum of Communication, Burntisland ARC, and assisted by members of the Glen Rothson District ARC, Poldu ARC, will be operating Golf Bravo 100 Mike Papa Delta. Grey Point Fort ARS will operate GB1WWC and GB0GPF. The Radio Officers Amateur Radio Society will operate GB100WWI and the HMS Belfast Radio Group will be operating GB100ARM. Chippenham and District ARC will activate with Golf Bravo 1 Whiskey Whiskey India and Coventry ARS will be operating GB1 BNS. Details are all usually available on QRZ.com. Don't forget we're happy to publicise your public event on GB2RS in Radcom and on the RSGB website. Don't forget to send in those details to radcom at rsgb.org.uk as early as you possibly can. And one condition for getting a UK special event call sign is that the station must be open to the public so our free publicity can really help make your efforts more widely known. Moving on to the contest news now, the WAE DXRTTY contest ends its 24-hour run at 23.59 UTC on Sunday the 11th. Using the 3.5 to 28 MHz contest bands, the exchange is signal report and serial number. On Monday, the Autumn Series contest runs from 2000 to 2130. Using data only on the 80-metre band, the exchange is signal report and serial number. 
On Tuesday, it's the 432 megahertz FM activity contest running from 1900 to 2000 UTC using FM only. It's immediately followed by the all mode 432 megahertz UK activity contest from 2000 to 2230 UTC. The exchange for both contests is a signal report serial number and locator. Also on Tuesday, it's the IRTS Evening Counties contest, running from 2000 to 2130 UTC. Using CW and SSB on the 80 metre band, the exchange's signal report and serial number, and stations in EI and GI also send their county. On Thursday, the 70 MHz FM activity contest is on the air from 1900 to 2000 UTC using FM only, and it's immediately followed by the all mode 70 MHz UK activity contest from 2000 to 2230 UTC. The exchange for both contests there is signal report, serial number, and locator. Now, next Saturday, the 17th, the second 1.8 MHz contest runs from 1900 to 2300 UTC using CW only, the exchange's signal report, serial number, and district code. And finally, it's next Sunday, the 18th, for the UK Microwave Group's low band contest. It runs from 10 in the morning to 1400 UTC in the afternoon using all modes on the 1.3 to 3.4 gigahertz bands. The exchange is signal report, serial number and locator. Now, we seem to have been battered by lots of wet and windy weather, but here's the scoop with the radio propagation report for the week ahead, compiled by Golf Zero Kilo Yankee Alpha, Golf 3 Yankee Lima Alpha, and Golf 4 Bravo Alpha Oscar on Friday, the 9th of November. The large geomagnetic disturbance that we predicted last week actually hit the Earth on Sunday evening and Monday morning as the plasma cloud was moving slower than experts actually predicted. Nevertheless, its effects were dramatic, pushing the KP index to 6 and sparking widespread visible aurora, even from parts of the UK. The geomagnetic storm hit HF conditions on Monday with propquest.co.uk showing maximum usable frequencies over a 3,000 kilometre path struggling to exceed 12 to 13 megahertz in the morning. Things did improve as the week went on, but conditions remained unsettled with the KP index still hitting 4 on Thursday the 8th. It'll be good to be able to give you better news for next week, but another very large earth-facing corona hole on the sun on Thursday means that we can probably expect more unsettled geomagnetic conditions on Saturday the 10th and Sunday the 11th. NOAA agrees and predicts the KP index could reach at least 4 with the threat of suppressed maximum usable frequencies on HF. The better news is that conditions may then improve and we may see better HF propagation from Wednesday onwards. There have been some HF highlights, however. Ron, Golf 3 Sierra Victor Whiskey, reports working Brian, 9 Juliet 2 Bravo Oscar in Zambia on 15 metres last Sunday. And Andy, Mike 0 November Kilo Romeo, reports that another Andy, 5 Romeo 8 Uniform Papa in Madagascar was active on 80 metres, which is a pretty long haul from the UK for early November. The VHF and upwards propagation news looks like this for next week. Well, this weekend we're still under the influence of a large area of low pressure just to the northwest of Britain, and it means a mild and rather breezy pattern of southwesterly winds and scattered showers, some likely to be very heavy and perhaps quite thundery. Rain scatter will therefore be a possibility for stations on the microwave bands. High pressure returns to the east of the UK, and therefore tropo will only be an occasional presence for the eastern side of the country, perhaps across the North Sea, for example. This leaves us with the possibility of aurora due to disturbed geomagnetic conditions, and the tip here is to follow the KP index, which is a measure of actually how disturbed the Earth's magnetic field is, and thus indicates the prospects for aurora. Values greater than 5 or 6 should be starting to attract your interest. As well as the smaller northern Taurids meteor shower on Monday, the Leonids reach their peak next Saturday, and with a zenithal hourly rate, or ZHR of 15, it's one of the largest showers of the year. 
The Leonids occasionally produce a meteor storm with a ZHR of more than 1,000. The last one was 2001, but that's not predicted this year. So look for enhanced reflections from Sunday on the lower VHF bands. The moon is at minimum declination today and apogee on Wednesday, so it's a poor week for EME. And that's it from your propagation team for another week. And that is all we've got for your GB2RS national news for the UK from around the world this week. Don't forget, try and catch up with your regional GB2RS newsreader who is on the air reading your very local GB2RS news stories right where you live every Sunday. If you're not sure who's doing it, where and when, head over to the TX Factor website at txfactor.co.uk. On the homepage there is a GB2RS news tab. If you click on that, you can navigate your way to downloading an up-to-date PDF file with the names of all the broadcasters across the country and what time they're on the air. Just to remind you as well, the deadline for GB2RS news items is 10 a.m. sharp on Thursday mornings, although we prefer information as far in advance as possible, and you should only be sent to radcom at rsgb.org.uk. I'm Mike Marsh, G1IAR, reporting with the TX News weekly podcast of GB2RS. Thanks for listening. Have a good week, good DX, and we'll see you back here next week with a fresh edition of GB2RS News. The old pilot's plain tales. The Luftwaffe pilot and the old pub. Two pilots from the Second World War meet and drink beers, recounting war stories. It wasn't an unusual thing in years gone by, although nowadays those veterans are sadly becoming thin on the ground. These two pilots flew together in the war, but not as you might think. I've spoken disparagingly in the past about the Nazi regime, but of course, nothing is pure black and white. There were heartless combatants on both sides, but there were also good people. And this is one of those heart-lifting acts of compassion that came as an unexpected gift to a crew in the most desperate of situations. Second Lieutenant Charles Brown was a farm boy from Weston in West Virginia who enlisted during the war and trained as a pilot. He qualified as an aircraft commander and on the 20th of December 1943 he and his rookie crew were flying their very first mission with the 379th Bomber Group of the 8th Air Force stationed at RAF Kimbleton in Cambridgeshire. The airfield was near the ancient village of the same name that is home to many old pubs like the George, the Wheat Sheaf and the Mermaid, some of which have stood since the 14th century. If you are ever out that way and drive the B road between Kimbleton and Stowe Longer, you will cross over the remains of the main runway that Charlie Brown took off from on that day. He was flying a B-17F Flying Fortress, which was named Ye Olde Pub, I suspect because of the crew's habit of visiting the local hostelries in their downtime. Charlie Brown was a youngster of 21, and conscious of his youth, he had told his crew that he was 25, but regardless, he was a good and conscientious commander who wanted to do his best for his men. The mission that they were engaged on that day was a notoriously difficult one. They were tasked with bombing the Focke-Wulf 190 aircraft factory at Bremen. Their pre-flight briefing reminded them to be vigilant as they might encounter dozens of German fighters and Bremen was surrounded by 250 accurate flat guns. The oldie pub was given a formation position nicknamed Purple Heart Corner, a spot on the edge of the formation that was considered particularly vulnerable since the fighters often engaged the edges rather than risking going through the middle of a bomber formation. 
running in towards the target at 27,000 feet and in strict formation, so unable to jink or manoeuvre to avoid either the fighters or the flak, the luck ran out for Charlie Brown and his crew. Anti-aircraft shells hit ye olde pub, shattering the plexiglass nose, destroying their number two engine and damaging the number four, which Charlie had to throttle back to prevent from overspeeding. Unable to keep up with his formation and be protected by the arcs of supporting fire from adjacent aircraft, Eoldi Pub suffered repeated fighter attacks. Again and again, over a dozen Messerschmitt ME-109s and Focke-Wulf 190s fired at Charlie's aircraft. 20mm cannon shells and 13mm machine gun bullets raking the bomber, and it was testament to the B-17 strength, armour plating and firepower that they were able to continue with their bomb run. The young aircraft commander lined up his aircraft and they finally released their bomb load down onto the target. But with the attacks continuing, things were getting desperate. The number three engine was also damaged and would only produce around half power. The crew oxygen system was gone and both the hydraulic and electric systems damaged. Half of the rudder had been shot away as was the left elevator and most of the tailplane on that side. With the nose cone gone, a bitterly cold gale of air was blowing through the aircraft at minus 60 degrees centigrade. Most of the guns had frozen up and jammed, and many of the crew were wounded. The tail gunner, Eki Eckenrode, had been decapitated by a direct hit from a cannon shell. A Russian Yelisenko, the waist gunner, was critically wounded in the leg, which would eventually need amputation. Blackie Blackford, the ball turret gunner's feet were frozen when his heated suit short-circuited, and Dick Peachout, the radio operator, had been hit in the eye by a cannon shell. Charlie Brown himself had also joined the list of wounded when he was struck in the shoulder. Their morphine supply had frozen and was useless. The radio and intercom systems were wrecked, and the aircraft, with only one engine providing full power, was peppered with holes and very badly damaged. However, throughout this short and vicious air battle, the gunners brought down one enemy fighter and damaged two others before, by a combination of lack of oxygen and the damage to the aircraft, Charlie lost control. Ye olde pub! turned onto its back and plummeted towards the ground. Circling down in a death spiral, the entire crew lost consciousness. Miraculously, Charlie Brown came round, and with barely enough height left, he pulled the crippled aircraft out of the dive and recovered. There was another pilot in the air at that time. He was an ace Luftwaffe fighter pilot, with 27 victories, who had flown over 400 combat missions. Ludwig Franz Stigler was the younger of two sons, who grew up in a Catholic family. His father had flown in the First World War, and with another veteran pilot, who was then the local priest, he helped set up a gliding school. Franz got his first chance to become a pilot, but his mother wanted him to train as a priest. However, after being caught with the local brewmaster's daughter, it became clear that the world of aviation was his true calling. Stigler earned a degree in aeronautical engineering and then became an airline pilot for Lufthansa before training for the military. His family were vocally opposed to the rise of Hitler. Indeed, at one point, Franz was interviewed by the Gestapo, but soon the country was at war, and Franz did his duty. He flew with some of the best fighter pilots that Germany ever produced, Adolf Galland and Gustav Rodel, who once told him, You are fighter pilots, first, last, always. 
if I ever hear of any of you shooting at someone in a parachute, I'll shoot you myself. Back in control of the crippled B-17, Charlie Brown recalled, I either spiralled or spun and came out of the spin just above the ground. My only conscious memory was of dodging trees, but I had nightmares for years and years about dodging buildings and then trees. I think the Germans thought that we had spun in and crashed. He oldie pub was staggering on at 1,000 feet when Franz Stigler, in his sleek ME109, spotted him. Stigler needed just one more kill to win his knight's cross, so he closed on the lone bomber. However, through the damaged bomber's airframe, Stigler was able to see the injured men. The rear guns hung down and he had a clear view of the bloody tail gunner's body as he moved up. He told interviewers in 1991 that he was aghast at the amount of damage the bomber had sustained. Its nose cone was missing. It had gaping holes in the fuselage. He could see crew members giving first aid to the wounded, and most of the plane's guns hung limp, unmanned. Stigler was a man of honour who once said, You follow the rules of war for you not your enemy. You fight by rules to keep your humanity. Staying in formation with the bomber and convinced the aircraft would never make it back to England. I saw his gunner lying in the back profusely bleeding so I couldn't shoot. I tried to get him to land in Germany and he didn't react at all. So I figured, well, turn him to Sweden because his airplane was so shot up. I never saw anything flying so shot up. A bewildered Brown stared back through his side window, not believing what he was seeing. He had already counted himself as a casualty numerous times, but this strange German pilot kept gesturing at him. There was no way he was going to land the plane, but the pilot stayed with him, until they reached the North Sea. When it was clear that Brown wasn't staying in Germany, Stigler saluted, peeled off, and flew out of Ye Olde Pub's nightmarish day. How Charlie Brown managed to fly the 250 miles across the North Sea and land his plane at RAF Seething, home of the 448th Bomb Group, Nobody knew, but he did a magnificent job. As his citation for the Air Force Cross says, displaying the coolness, courage and airmanship of more senior pilots, he boldly rejected the enemy fighters' attempts at forced landing and directed the struggling aircraft to the North Sea. Whilst attempting this improbable, treacherous return to home station, Lieutenant Brown's command and control was instrumental to the remaining crew's survival. While in the cockpit, he provided the essential engine control, fuel management and piloting skills necessary to the cockpit team during their hazardous yet miraculous return of the aircraft's perilous crossing of the North Sea back to home station in England. Through his extraordinary heroism, superb airmanship and aggressiveness in the face of the enemy, Lieutenant Brown reflected the highest credit upon himself and the United States Army Air Corps. At the after-flight debriefing, Charlie Brown and his crew were told not to repeat this to the rest of the unit so as not to build up any positive feelings towards enemy pilots. Brown commented, Someone decided you can't be human and be flying in a German cockpit. Stiegler said nothing of the incident to his commanding officers, knowing that a German pilot who spared the enemy while in combat risked execution. And so you think the story might end. But... Not so. 
Charlie flew a total of 29 missions before being offered a position in the Department of State. He served his country as a foreign service officer and as a diplomat before founding an environmental research center and being named the National Inventor of the Year in 1987. About this time, he started thinking about that fateful day in 1943. He started having nightmares, but in his dream, there would be no act of mercy. He would awaken just before his bomber crashed. Brown took on a new mission. He tried to find that German pilot whose code of honour had allowed him to live that day. He scoured military archives in the US and England. He attended pilots' reunions and shared his story. He finally placed an ad in a German newsletter for former Luftwaffe pilots, retelling the story and asking if anyone knew the pilot. He had to find that German. Who was he? Why did he save my life? On the 18th of January 1990, Brown received a letter. He opened it and read, Dear Charles, all these years I wondered what happened to that B-17. Did she make it home? Did her crew survive their wounds? To hear of your survival has filled me with indescribable joy. It was Stigler. Brown wrote in reply, To say thank you, on behalf of my surviving crew members and their families, appears totally inadequate. Stigler had survived the war, ending up as an ME262 jet pilot, but afterwards he found life in Germany difficult. He moved to Canada and worked as an engineer for many years, eventually buying an old ME108, which he painted in his old Jagdschwada markings and flew at air shows as the bad guy. Both pilots, now retired, were living in North America, and when they met, they hugged and wept and laughed about their encounter, but the deep emotion of the event was never far below the surface. Stigler had lost his brother, his friends and his country. He was virtually exiled by his countrymen after the war. There were 28,000 pilots who fought for the German Air Force. Only 1,200 survived. The war cost him everything. Charlie Brown was the only good thing to come out of World War II for Franz. It was the one thing he could be proud of. The meeting helped Brown as well, says his oldest daughter, Dawn. Brown and Stigler became close friends. They shared fishing trips together. They would fly cross-country to each other's homes and take road trips together to share their story at schools and veterans' reunions. Brown's daughter says her father would worry about Stigler's health and constantly check in on him. It wasn't just for show, she says. They really did feel for each other. They talked about once a week. As his friendship with Stigler deepened, something else happened to her father, Dawn says. The nightmares went away. The two men remained close until they passed away within months of each other in 2008. After Charlie Brown's death, the family found a book given to him by Stigler. Inside was an inscription. In 1940, I lost my only brother as a night fighter. On the 20th of December, four days before Christmas, I had the chance to save a B-17 from her destruction. Her plane so badly damaged, it was a wonder that she was still flying. The pilot... Charlie Brown is for me as precious as my brother was. Thanks, Charlie. Your brother, Franz.
Plane Tales is a featured segment of the Airline Pilot Guy Show Aviation Podcast. Find us at airlinepilotguy.com. Daily Minutes zijn dagelijks vanaf ongeveer 1900 uur te beluisteren. De uitzending wordt een dag later om half elf ochtends herhaald. Alle mail is welkom op het adres x xdv.me. Dat is ook te vinden rechts boven aan de webpagina van de uitzending in www.a0ete.nl. De Daily Minutes toont iedere dag weer aan de hand van schokkende voorbeelden hoe een hobby mensenlevens kan veranderen. De internetfaciliteiten en studio hardware voor Daily Minutes worden gesponsord door 70 MHzshop.nl. 70 MHzshop.nl. En microfoon naar retour.